All right, welcome everyone um, to this uh, issue of the of uh, the podcast for the Pocus Journal, PocusJournal.com. My name is Dr. Galen. I have the privilege of moderating a discussion today uh, with one of our authors, uh, Dr. David McCreary, and uh, we have uh, the special privilege um, to to be joined today by the pediatric um, edit editorial board of the Pocus Journal, Dr. Beryl Graywood and Dr. Rhea Dansel, who are on. Um, we're recording live here. Um, we've got an incredible um, you know, collection of articles to talk about, focusing on uh, soft tissue ultrasound, in, in particular in pediatrics. Um, but I want to take a second for our um, panel today to introduce themselves. So we'll start with you, uh, Dr. McCurry, if you could tell us just a little bit about yourself and um, about your, um, you know, maybe perhaps when you first fell in love with McCurry ultrasound, if you have an example of a case that really uh, we call the, the first kiss when you realized um, how important it was to include point of care ultrasound in your practice. Absolutely. So good evening, everyone, as it is the evening here in the UK. So I'm coming to you from the north of England. Um, I'm David McCreary. I'm a pediatric emergency medicine consultant. Um, I work in a sort of large district general hospital that sees around 33,000 children per year. We work in a dedicated pediatric emergency department. Um, with great cross-pollination with our adult colleagues. Um, excellent question in relation to my first POCUS case. So my background is that I've undertaken postgraduate certification and degree in POCUS um, from a local university. And in our department, we find ourselves in a really serendipitous position where around seven, of, I think seven of the consultants have that same degree. So we're all young, kind of, well, not so young maybe, but we're all um, fresh faced and ready to, you know, as you say, fly the the first hip for a child who came in with limp and um, possibly a discussion for another evening, but ultimately a fusion found on hip scan, um, child entirely well, decided to undertake some blood tests in order to kind of corroborate my findings and discuss with the orthopedic team. And long story short, this was a case of septic arthritis. So um, child had had a series of x-rays, was about to be discharged without a plan. I got involved, did a scan, bigger fusion, septic arthritis. So a bit of a pickup from my perspective. And as you say, um, Jamie fell in love with, uh, with focus from there. That's really an incredible case. Thank you for um, for telling us about that. I think uh, a case like that where point of care ultrasound really, um, you know, saved the day or, or someone trained to use it, save the day, um, really highlights how, how um, important the tool is. Uh, thanks so much. Uh, Dr. Dansel, can you tell us about, about yourself? Hi, uh, my name is Rhea Dansel. I am a Professor of Internal Medicine and Pediatrics at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Um, I also direct our medicine procedure service. I am currently on service on the pediatric side now, so um, if you hear any code blues, <laughs> we have to go quickly. Um, my first kiss um, was actually an, on an adult patient. A young, a young adult patient who had lupus, and um, long story short, we found a pretty large pericardial effusion because of her lupus, and were able to get her to the, sort of expedite her to the cath lab. Although, um, Dr. McCreary, I would love to see and and diagnose a hip effusion in a limping child myself. I have not yet had an opportunity to do that. In terms of my first kiss on the pediatric side, it was actually a child who had um, lymphadenopathy. Um, and we were getting ready to send that child home because the erythema was gone, but the lump was still there. And I said, well, let's take a look before we do this. And it looked like everything had just sort of ne coalesced and necrosed. And instead of sending that child home, that child went to the operating room. And I said, this is it's a good segue into what we're going to be talking today, which um, will be soft tissue ultrasound. But first, my good friend, Dr. Graywood. Hi friends, I'm Dr. Graywood, Beryl Graywood. I'm a director of point of care ultrasound at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, um, which is within the University of Pennsylvania system. And I love um, the work that I do there, but my first kiss was actually in London. So it's kind of nice, a nice little circle here because when I finished my um, pediatric training in the States, I actually ended up in the UK for two years doing an infectious disease um, fellowship. and 
one of the most interesting parts for me was when I got there, I trained at Boston Children's, I felt like I know pediatrics, and then I recognized I knew nothing about pediatrics, at least how to practice it in a different system. And that was one of the most um, both frightening and thrilling experiences because I really got to learn how to use medicine in a different way. And one of those ways was using ultrasound. One of the things that I also also found interesting is how um, pediatrics was such a subspecialty. And so even though I was doing fellowship in infectious disease, I was um, at times running the A&E because I was, as they say, the most senior pediatrician in-house at the time um, when I was on call. And so I found myself actually having to rely on a lot of things that I hadn't necessarily learned in the U.S. system, which was a great experience. And ultrasound was one of those um, tools that I picked up and then was able to bring back with me when I started as faculty at CHOP. And it's been such a delight to build the program there and really kind of um, lead us into the next sort of phase of how we think about bedside medicine. Really incredible to hear from you all um, and the connections be between your past experiences. It's really um, awesome to have you here. Um, I wondered if we could just tell um, our listeners a little bit about uh, some of the differences and some of the roles you were talking about, like, um, you know, uh, David, you described yourself as a consultant, um, and then you mentioned, um, Beryl, about A&E. I think some of the, the U.S.-based listeners may not quite know what those roles are. If you could just sort of explain a little bit about um, how your jobs may be different across the pond. Yeah, I'm happy to field that one if, if Beryl's okay with that. So I, I yeah. thought this might, might, might come up. Um, I'm, I'm involved with a group who meet actually on a Thursday night in the northeast of the US, um, who are a good bunch of PEM pediatricians who I'd highly recommend. Um, maybe plug them at the end of the show if that's all right with you guys, just sharing cases. So it's often a bit of a glossary of terms from the UK practice. Ultimately, a consultant would be um, the same as your attending physician, you know, the sort of team leader. Um, you know, where at the end of your training, you you ultimately, as, as as Beryl says, would be running an um, accident emergency. That was the other um, that was the other acronym for A and E, um, an emergency department, basically. And yeah, it's um, you, as you, I'm sure everyone will agree here. This one of the limiting factors, which I know we'll talk about in due course, is the is the availability of oversight of of good trainers and people who are able to facilitate ongoing focus development and oversee scans from a governance perspective. So when I became a consultant around about four years ago, I found myself in this position whereby I was training in focus. I was um, helping lead a team. And yeah, you, you found yourself find yourself with another role and responsibility to, yeah. to really champion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I will definitely um, echo that, that I think that was the surprising part of finding myself in that position, but also a great learning curve. I tell the residents all the time that if you train in the same system from start to finish, you really learn medicine one way. If you expose yourself to other systems and you truly learn um, all the different sort of nuances and the art of medicine truly. And I, I thought it was just such a great experience. And I think also, um, I again, I trained at Boston Children's, I'm now at CHOP. So these are resource dense um, areas I was in. And then I found myself in an institution that was well equipped, but definitely slower access to some imaging modalities and also just how um, resources are used or thought about. And I think that was such a, just a valuable experience to think about, well, how do I rely on my history and physical before I'm thinking about what I'm ordering for imaging? And then therefore at the bedside, how can I accomplish what I can do right here without having to think about the setting a patient for a imaging study that may take a lot of time to get to, or may not be able to be done in an expeditious sort of way. That's a, uh, really, um, really interesting to hear how point of care ultrasound is incorporated into, you know, your practice. That's, um, I think, a great segue to, to jump into uh, David's case report from uh, the November issue of Pocus Journal. So um, if everyone's OK, we'll just dive right in. The, um, you know, the case is uh, called a rare case of neck lump in an infant. This is from our November issue. And um, I'll let uh, David kind of sort of summarize the case for us and um, tell us a little bit about how point of care ultrasound, you know, really impacted his uh, management up front when he, you know, saw this young child with the neck mass. Thank you so much. So I was on the shop floor on a busy morning and ultimately I walked in to find a five month old girl who looked fairly well with a concern from a parent who'd noticed 
a neck lump. Now, a few things were really interesting about this. The child looked very well and had no relevant past medical history and I deduced she, she had been entirely well. But one, this was a remarkably sized large lump, you know, remarkably large lump for an infant of this size, way beyond the kinds of things that we might pick up in, in young infants and um, some of the differentials I can talk about. And number two, and this is appears to be the God's honest truth from, from the family, this was not evident the previous evening. So well child, um, sent to nursery completely well and ultimately sent home from nursery school with a very large left-sided neck mass. So of course, uh, you know, the question comes, should we should we poke us? And of course that was always going to be on the agenda, but I wanted to, you know, examine this child thoroughly, take an, in a complete history. I was asking about things that typically perhaps I wouldn't in my daily practice, you know, in terms of TB contact and exposure, family history, um, you know, of far reaching more rare conditions. Um, of course, examined the child top to toe, felt for liver and for spleen enlargement, of which there was none. And ultimately I was faced with this large mass. Now, I always tell the junior doctors that we overestimate the size of of a, of, a, of, a, of a lump of a mass, um, particularly somewhere within the neck. So we've got all of the overlying soft tissues. It's very difficult to be convinced of a circumscribed mass in terms of size. And, you know, having started to scan things, it's amazing to be able to sort of almost downgrade the sizes for, for example, a lymph node. You know, it's not three by three as the junior docs had thought it was. It was, you know, one, 1 1.1 by 1 1.2, which is much more reassuring. I'm sure you'll all agree. So I found a, 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 a neck mass that was genuinely sort of way beyond that. It was getting on for around five by five centimetres. It's shown in figure one of the article, um, if anyone has a chance to, to look back at that. There was no redness, there was no particular warmth. It was certainly, certainly non-tender. It wasn't particularly kind of mobile in the same way that I would expect from, again, most, most simple masses that we see. It felt slightly deeper. And it was sort of down here at the kind of level five area, kind of probably posterior to the sternocleidomastoid muscle. So in, in my article, I uh, talk about some blood tests. We'll, we'll save those for after because in chronological order, we uh, whipped the probe out. So uh, we have a, a GE Logic, which is a really nice machine, gives you excellent pictures uh, for anyone who uses that machine what it maybe loses in a little bit of user friendliness, it, it, it makes up for an excellent images. We have got a high frequency linear 12 and we've also got the hockey stick, which we just um, procured over the last few months, which is a 18 megahertz, which is really good as well. I used the 12 for this and placed it on in sort of a, sh a short axis approach um, at, at the neck and was basically struck by seeing something that I didn't quite recognize. This was very large. This was unusual for a number of reasons. So the first thing that struck me was this didn't look like the average cyst or the average lymph, lymph node that I was you know, used to seeing. Not only was the site being low down and slightly posterior and the neck a bit of a concern, but the echogenicity was just, you know, it was all wrong. I was initially on my figure two in the article um, looking at the the first sort of appearances of it, wondering whether this was just the maintained central echogenicity that you see for a lymph nodes, or, you know, I was taught the lymph nodes have this sort of, you know, nourishing sort of central hilum, look like a kidney. And I often kind of follow that in different planes and try to identify that. And that should be readily appreciable for all lymph nodes, normal lymph nodes, that is. And this just looked all wrong. There were some variable degrees of echogenicity throughout almost tiny, tiny cystic areas. I sort of didn't really like the look of this at all. So, um, David, yeah. let me ask you while you're there, and, and you know, folks listening can uh, take a look at focusjournal.com at the um, some of the images that you know, really terrific uh, point of care image, um, you know, that that's uh, side by side with the physical exam. But um, I just want to ask you because I think the, the um, you know, including focus as your initial evaluation. I mean, this is already, um, and I don't treat kids. Um, you know, th th this is already a very concerning by size on, on exam, but I, I really do appreciate the point you made about how, you know, size or, or surrounding swelling or other soft tissue can kind of um, be misleading. So um, just at the initial um, case, this child's not critically ill, um, 
you know, uh, what are some what are some of the differential items that that were first crossing your mind as you're, you know, integrating your uh, the, the point of care ultrasound findings with with your, um, you know, the the history and and well exam. Yeah, absolutely. What are some things you were thinking? You, you mentioned I think you mentioned scrofula, like you know, TB risk factor, but um, you were thinking it could have been a, a reactive lymph node or. Absolutely, a yeah, great question. So, um, I mean, again, on my first shift as a consultant, I a girl landed in my trauma clinic with a cold TB abscess. Now, again, we're not seeing a great deal of that where we live, although there are little pockets. So always a really big learning point f for that sort of a thing. Um, I mean, I guess a month prior, I'd seen an infant with, you know, what we felt was an infantile torticollis. And that was my first experience of scan scanning, you know, a sternocleidomastoid tumour as it's known or a fibromatosis coli. So that's really interesting where the muscle sort of, you know, firms up into a knot, you have this fusiform swelling, and it could theoretically be in that site along the sternocleidomastoid border, but this was even bigger than that. I mean, it was firm, it was it was large. So that was one thing I'd considered. Um, obviously, some sort of a cyst for which I'd be expecting, you know, very, very smooth circular walls, almost completely anechoic throughout was, would be what I'd expect with maybe a bit of posterior acoustic enhancement. Um, so again, I'd, I could kind of exclude anything fluid filled. Now, I was going to mention before, Jamie, that the next thing that happened was that I came onto a radius. You know, I, I persuaded my friendly radiologist who, who I know very well and will sometimes check. I was sort of chief pediatric um, sonographer. I'll often check some of my findings in different parts of the body with her. You know, my first pyloric stenosis. I asked her, would she just come and review my images? Would she repeat the scan? She's fantastic. She just gets me on her machine. Come on, have a go with this probe. Have a look. This is how I do it. This is what my overview with the curvy linear. Da, da, da. So I, I wanted this to be checked, but I knew there'd be things that perhaps I hadn't even scanned myself. So in, in the article, I refer to hemangiomas, um, you know, which have a kind of a sort of deeper appearance. Um, they can be sort of widespread internal vascularity um, on your color flow which again would be different for what you expect with a lymph node which is more just through the hilum mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so so in the radius image you see that this vascularity was was really enhanced it was it was almost chaotic is the way i like to think about it um again i didn't like the look of that and just ultimately knew that for more sinister differentials this would be in relation to sort of neangiogenesis this would be what i'd be expecting really so we looked at this together and we weren't particularly happy um right let me let me just ask i think you know, for the um other uh panelists here on the on our podcast you know let's say this had been anechoic or fluid filled i think it's very big and you know if the history is accurate very fast growing so it may not have been um something you treated immediately in, in, in the neck um particularly but as far as soft tissue findings you know had, had it been something very simple like a cyst um, or had it had a, a features of an abscess, you know, you might have put a needle in it to try to uh, make that diagnosis. Um, what, what do you think, um, Beryl and, and Rhea, you know, in terms of how POCUS uh, jumped in? I mean, once you found it was solid like this, that's not, you know, this is already uh, a very different thinking process. But I'm just curious if, if um, you know, if it had been smaller and if it had been maybe a higher concern for something like a, like a boil, you know, like an abscess, would you have put a needle in it or IND'd it? I think one of the things that we are always teaching um, quite uh, up front is that you don't put a needle into something without color. Um, and I think that that's one of the biggest keys here is that internal vascularization changes the game on sticking a needle in, into it. <laughs> that's a great point. Thank you. Um, yeah. <laughs> no, it is a great point. It's, it's always color before you cut, right? Just like, I guess, kindergarten. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I honestly, I would get my hand slapped if I tried to put a needle in, in a child <laughs> um, because I have had my hand slapped before. But um, earlier we were talking about my first kiss and it was very similar in appearance, at least at the beginning, um, maybe somewhat slightly different because this is clearly Dr. McCreary's case is clearly a single entity um, that looks solid. Whereas in the case that I talked about, it was uh, an amalgamation of lymph nodes and we could sort of watch it over time evolve into a, a basically a, po a pocket of pus. And so um, that went to the operating room or the, the theater, I think, as uh, <laughs> Dr. McCurry would say. But um, these images are 
in incredible in that it's um, clearly a very solid mm. mass here. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, Rhea, can I, can I, oh, I was going to say, uh, Jimmy, if you don't mind, can I come that, back to that point? That's a really excellent point. Um, I guess one of the one of the commonest findings we we would identify would be lymph, lymph tissue. So a lymph node or, you know, a, a reactive enlarged single lymph node or lymphadenitis. And mm -hmm. I think one amazing learning point that I've taken over the past sort of six to 12 months is that many things in medicine, paediatric medicine especially, and in particular with I, as highlighted by POCUS, is that things are a spectrum. So, yeah. I mean, I bet none of us could could give a definitive definition, for example, of what lymphadenitis is versus reactive lymphadenopathy versus lymph node versus this, this, this. So as pre-POCUS, I, I don't know how you guys feel. I used to look at a child's neck swelling, you know, maybe an older child, certainly than, than I would do in this case, a five month old. And I would think, okay, this is a well child, we're going to do some bloods, the bloods are probably not going to be too crazy in this in this case, because the child's afebrile, they're very well. And you make a decision about which ones you would be willing to start on oral antibiotics, broad spectrum antibiotics, and review it within 36 hours, you know, 48 hours if they remain well. And with good safety netting, those would be the, the group who you'd think, okay, there's no indication for, for definite IV, you know, for IV antibiotics and admission and potentially involvement with the, the ENT team. That would be the second thing that, you know, that would be what we do down the line slightly. And POCUS has really crystallized that for me that you can scan something. I don't know who, who among us do many scans for lymphadenitis, but you ultimately see a sort of cluster of lymph nodes, a bunch of grapes, you know, there are what, two to 300 lymph nodes in the head and neck alone in total. And we see five or six, seven, eight, nine, ten small lymph nodes all enlarged together, representing something like a lymphadenitis. Um, now, the brilliant binary question with POCUS for, for, for scanning a neck is, is this abscessed? Do we definitively need to think about IND, theatre, further scanning, or is this an early reactive lymph, lymphadenopathy or lymphadenitis? I don't know what you guys feel about that point. Well, I, if I could just respond, I think one of the excellent um, you know, points you make is about uh, routine scanning of, of common head and neck complaints. So if you, I think, uh, get for those listeners who are just sort of starting out, they may not have had you know, much formal training for, for scanning lymph nodes or soft tissue scanning. But as you incorporate a lot of clinical examples, you know, that you said about what normal lymph nodes look like um, and, and then sort of clinically correlating that those patients got better with treatment of, under, of an underlying pharyngitis or some other cause, um, you know, that, that when you stumbled upon a zebra like this, um, you know, rare diagnosis that you would, the red flags go up because this doesn't look typical for a lymph node. It doesn't look like an abscess. It really looks um, like a solid mass. And I think that's what um, someone who has experience scanning a variety of, um, you know, whether it's adult patients or, or pediatric necks, um, w you know, would have a chance to, to learn. And I think the, the color point is really um, also very important in understanding how to use that to, um, to as part of your algorithm. Hmm. Sorry, I, I didn't think, know if, go ahead, Ria, yeah. Um, it's Barrow. I think one of the things that I also really um, applaud you on this, and I think is a huge takeaway for um, somebody coming to ultrasound is that check-in with radiology. You know, I think sometimes we get really excited about bed side ultrasound and, you know, being able to do it all ourselves. But when you stumble on something that you don't know or don't understand, really being able to say, okay, here's maybe my no-go area where I do need a formal radiologic exam, where I do need to reach out and ask somebody else. And I think that that, um, that sort of ability to understand scope is really important when you are trying to use bedside ultrasound um, so that you are keeping patients safe as much as we are thinking about the good and great sides of ultrasound, also thinking about what the scope of ultra, bedside ultrasound is. Excellent point. I'm really so glad um, that you highlighted that. I think that recognizing that it's something you don't um, uh, see regularly or you're not familiar with and then incorporating that, I, I think, I mean, and, and doing it rapidly. I think getting, um, you know, up triaging the case to, to prioritizing, you know, imaging like that ultrasounds, um, you know, was really a great call. Uh, mm -hmm. David, tell us what happened with the case, um, you know, next, how, how did it, after you got the, the focus findings that were really unusual and grabbed your radiology colleagues, how did it, how did it go? Yeah, so, so even the experienced sonographers differentials didn't really extend to anything. Uh, sarcoma was, was talked about, I must say, but, you know, none of us would have suspected 
such such a rare diagnosis of an extra osseous earrings or something like that. We proceeded really quickly um, to cross-sectional imaging. It actually happened the following morning because we were sort of heading well into the evening now. But um, the ENT team were involved. We'd commenced the infant on broad spectrum IV antibiotics. Further bloods were undertaken. And um, initial discussions were being had, to be honest, with the oncology team. So then this fantastic MRI pictures uh, were obtained where there's sadly more more mass than than baby really um on the particularly on the transverse images um i think it, it represents it shows its depth it shows the even at a an mr level and i will never be able to get the different weightings correct so i wouldn't even begin to comment on them but you can see almost what we would perceive to be the mixed echo you know um kind of um, texture based on the appearances there on the MRI. So we already know this doesn't, this doesn't really look good in terms of a, a you know, a, a diagnosis. So our tertiary oncologists are based at a different hospital, but we have a good relationship with, with them. We liaise with them and the child was transferred there and ultimately histology confirmed a, an extra osseous Ewing sarcoma. So that's um, a sarcoma, which is a malignant tumour, it's 10 times less common than a, than a bony Ewing's. Ewing's is a, a common bony tumour in children, but still very rare in terms of real numbers um, for obvious reasons. You know, solid tumours not being vastly, vastly common in, in young patients. Um, this particular tumour is commoner in younger, in younger people under five. But yeah, I mean, she, she ultimately has gone on, thankfully, to do in is currently amidst treatment now but has gone on to receive proton beam therapy being the youngest in the uk for that and to be doing to be doing well thankfully so you know pocus was a true game changer in this in this case it was you know it started off me being hoping to show a parent what i was discussing as differentials when i examine and say okay this is what we're going to try and identify these are the almost voicing out loud these are the binary questions as to why I'm scanning this neck. I mean, in paediatrics, point of care ultrasound lends itself to, to it so much. I've, I've never, I've been taken back, taken aback so much by how much a parent appreciates, you know, being able to see the description of, of, the, of what you're giving, be that a, a hip effusion, an elbow effusion, sometimes even occult fractures we're, we're look, we, you know, we're utilizing as part of our MSK ultrasound a foreign body you know talking about bee lines on a you know on, on a sort of plethoric chest or a sort of infected kind of chest sort of picture so that i guess is how i started out i thought pokers can help answer some binary questions but ultimately it it, it fantastically streamlined the, the the care that that occurred here and, and things got got moving pretty quick thank, thankfully yeah, and David, if I may, the um, it's it's in your article, and it's it's uh, you know assumed for uh, users like yourselves, but I think some listeners, you know, would be reassured that for pediatrics, particularly, you know, point of care ultrasound has has no ionizing radiation, and as far as the technique, you know, I understand, um, you know, that that sedation is required for other imaging. A lot of the times, um, I'm not sure if sedation was required for uh, the MRI you mentioned, but uh, to be able to do this very quick at the bedside. Um, with, with non non invasively for for pediatrics is so um, appealing to me. Uh, absolutely, great point. I mean, you know, the Alara principle applies here massively. I read a paper just yesterday that said that I don't know if anyone caught this particular article. I think it was via PubMed. A single head CT scan was has been shown in a massive case series of nine hundred and fifty thousand children to increase risk potentially of glioma. Now, you know, of course, you take each each individual article. To add to the you know to support the sort of ongoing evidence i'm not going to quote that article verbatim and say that that's a thing but it's something i'm always aware of i undertake a, a sedation list every week um whereby we sedate children for mri to obtain long scans for 45 minutes 50 minutes and you're absolutely right pocus is just it's so quick easy accessible that i mean the only considerations from a theoretical safety perspective and i wrote my thesis on this is you know power uh, the, the the duration of time we scan for and therefore power in terms of overall wattage probably the only cons two considerations i can think about that would relate to is intraocular scans so if you're doing something like an optic nerve sheath diameter um you know for obvious reasons reasons heating and then the second of course everyone could tell me i'm sure the listeners could tell me would be um 
something I don't do, which is scanning little babies. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Absolutely. So, so entirely safe, but not, not just safe, you know, the children, the children love it. We have these, if we can, you know, move away from how drastic this particular case was and the findings we obtained, we have these soft models, which is both a fake, a fake probe, you know, like a foam probe as a toy, which uh, the, the rep, our friendly GE rep gave, gave us a whole bunch of them. So I, I kind of go into a room and I say, you know, I'm going to go back. I'm going to get a machine. It's nothing scary. It's not going to hurt. And we're going to, you know, show, show your body on it on a screen. You're going to love it. And then I give them the toy and I say, this is this is what I've got. You can have one as well. So we're holding the probe at the same time, get them to touch the gel. So it, the the repeatability, the accessibility, the the acceptance from parents and from children with with focus in our emergency department has has blown me away, quite frankly. That's really such a great uh, summary of the of those benefits. Uh, Vera Laria, any um, you know comments in response there about the uh, you know appeal of focus for pediatric applications? Yeah, I think that David really highlighted quite a lot of them. You know, obviously our biggest thing we're always thinking about in pediatrics is radiation, but in addition to some of the comfortability that he really highlighted, I am um, one of the providers in our sedation service, and much like yourself, we sedate for MRIs, CTs, procedures, and those come with risks as well. And so being able to do something that we don't necessarily need sedation for, we can distract with our child life services or whatever the case might be. And um, repeat the studies. I think uh, we just, it was about maybe three weeks ago now, had a really, really um, using ultrasound on a child who had presented with um, un failure to thrive, but some other um, unclear um, sort of characteristics Characteristics to their presentation, and seemed to over the in the early course of the day have some hemodynamic instability, and so she had actually just done a cardiac focus exam and felt that the function was good. And as the child's um, capillary field got a little bit slower, she repeated it and felt that the function was much different from where it had been earlier, just eight hours earlier on her shift, and called a rapid response and. As the rapid response was approaching, she actually went into cardiogenic shock and um, re required um, CPR. But really, the this resident's ability to compare from morning to her midday shift, the change in the um, cardiac function truly was what changed the outcome for that child. And the child is doing well now, but definitely a very scary moment that could have been missed. And, you know, a child really, um, I think also streamlined, you know, a child can code on the floor and you're not exactly sure what's going on, especially when you're not really sure what the diagnosis is and why the child has been admitted. But having that piece and that evidence that truly this function was good or okay, and now it looks horrible, you're able to sort of streamline, okay, we're thinking that this is the problem. And how are we going to then go through our algorithms when we're thinking about a child who's just found down. Wow, that's, it really um, adds to our discussion, not just for something like uh, the lumps and bumps of soft tissue, but but uh, talking about, you know, critical care applications in pediatrics, um, you know, that's that's quite the spectrum. Um, thank you so much. Uh, Rhea, do you have anything to add about the, uh, just uh, how appealing you find um, point of care ultrasound for pediatrics, uh, anything that hasn't been covered? Well, first of all, I want to say that I I really need one of those um, toy um, transducers. <laughs> oh, <laughs> we, we, should those, um, we should get them for the editorial board for, really Journal should. for, uh, for next year's holiday Great. season. Yeah. <laughs> I would love one of those to just sort of introduce like this is what we're going to do to you. Um, I think every my other panelists have spoken a lot about the the really important high points of why we use point of care ultrasound. It's 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 iterative. Um, there's no radiation involved. I like that parents could even be holding their children while I'm while I'm doing my exam, which um, does so much for them. Makes it much easier and much more comfortable for them. And then in terms of procedures, which we haven't really talked about, I think that we should be using ultrasound for IVs. Um, and then even very simple things like getting urine. We really should be looking first to, to even make sure that they have urine in the bladder before we do something as you know invasive as um, as catheterization. So, lots of really good reasons for using point of care ultrasound in pediatrics. Those are excellent points. Really, um, you know, and I think our, a lot of our listeners are already focus enthusiasts, but uh, these are great. Um, 
you know, applications and, and benefits that, that you can bring back to your uh, institutions and, and leadership to promote your programs. Um, getting back to some soft tissue, I, I do want to call attention for the listeners to figure seven um, of David's article. Uh, we already went through a lot of the elements of this algorithm, um, you know, things like an absent echogenic hilum, um, you know, would, would be concerning for malignant cause. This this extra osseous Ewing's uh, being, a you know, a, a rather zebra case, but I think illustrates some important uh, you know, points about what uh, made made the POCUS um, findings very unusual and, and what escalated, um, you know, care immediately. Um, I do want to bring in the fact that that I think soft tissue ultrasound, soft tissue POCUS is really, um, you know, a hot topic. Um, I think the, uh, it, not just in emergency medicine, pediatrics, um, you know, in internal medicine and hospital medicine, um, we have a, a few articles from uh, the November issue that 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 were also soft tissue cases, kind of coincidentally. Um, one was uh, the role of point of care ultrasound in pilonidal sinus disease, and I think that's um, you know, something really primarily treated, you know, surgically. Um, but this is a, from a general surgery unit um, in Dubai. They they submitted um, a really nice case series of um, how point of care ultrasound helps them to kind of stage pilonidal uh, disease, which which I think is great to compare. It's a soft tissue entity that I don't you know, see de novo uh, myself in my practice, but I think it's something to, um, you know, sort of incorporate as far as um, comparing your point of care images, um, you know, for soft tissue. Um, it's a nice, a really nice article. Um, my own group had a, a case of of a non-resolving hematoma that turned out to be an AVM. And, um, you know, that's, that's something uh, you, listeners take a look at. That's in the November issue. Um, you mentioned earlier about how important color is. This, um, you know, quote, hematoma uh, would have been, you know, a devastating, it would have been a devastating choice to try to IND that. Um, it had already been IND'd when it was a hematoma, which I think could have been contributing to how it developed into an, an AVM. But, uh, you know, the, the high vascularity um, of this with the, um, the sort of Pepsi Cola sign of, of high velocity internal flow, um, you know, really changed management on that one immediately. So um, that's a really good um, example of sort of soft tissue, probably another zebra, to be honest, I think, um, of the common things we see, uh, lots of lipomas and, and other more common soft tissue findings. There's a, another case I'm um, curious to get some other, because um, uh, it's a pediatric case, you know, from the panelists. Uh, this is by um, a group in um, the UK as well. Um, in November issue, they they describe a migrated, um, uh, excuse me, a retained migrated foreign body um, after penetrating injury. So this this was a case report of a child who had a piece of glass um, that was retained um, for it looks like I think um, at least nine months. Um, and then, uh, well, it's not POCUS imaging, it's diagnostic radiology imaging, but I think very um, important to, to be on the lookout. Um, you have to know what you're looking for to find it with point of care ultrasound. So uh, listeners take a look at the figures here of what a, a piece of glass would look like um, that, that have been retained. So um, those are three other cases from uh, POCUS Journal in November um, that uh, illustrate the, the utility of point of care ultrasound in particular uh, some of the pediatric um, population. Uh, I'm curious if uh, David or, or other editorial board members, if you had any other sort of thoughts about how these articles um, relate or about how soft tissue um, uh, POCUS has, uh, you know, been helpful or or maybe sort of future directions of soft tissue. Um, you know, what are your th thoughts about um, as we sort of wrap up maybe some additional, uh, you know, points for our listeners or, or resources for our listeners? I'll, I'll step in first if, if you guys are happy, if that's okay. Yes. So, I mean, excellent articles, um, Jamie, really excellent, loved reading them. Just not only do you learn, you know, about new entities, poss possibly in the same way people did reading reading my article, um, you know, the formation of an AVM and using POCUS to be, to be or using scanning to be safe and to exclude, um, to, con to you know, rule in and rule out particular conditions whereby you're going to not proceed with, for example, as you say, um, attempted drainage. So um, just to come back to what you mentioned in relation to the algorithm, um, I was just going to state one or two things that, that probably hold true for the, for the listeners who are going to be doing a bit of scanning. When you were talking about features to be aware of, um, just to highlight the thing about the ratio of, of long to short axis for a lymph node, if that's okay, because um, kind of produce that algorithm I suppose with a lot of features consistent with lymph nodes in mind um 
but just to talk about this rounded shape, this was something I was always taught. And I think the initial paper that discusses this goes back to 1995 in the British Journal of Radiology. So lymph nodes are, are sort of bean shaped. They shouldn't look circular. That's always a worrying sign. They should have a, a, a short to long axis ratio of 0.5 or a long to short of, of two. So I think that's a really good starting point um, just to pick back up on the, that you'd mentioned. Um, in terms of other applications for soft tissue, I think the limiting step with, with POCUS from my perspective is recognizing something that you maybe yourself haven't scanned before. So um, I'd, I used to probably do a fair bit of semi-contributory scanning whereby I would probably, I don't know if it caused a bit of difficulty for our radiologists, but occasionally I would I would scan something and I would I just really want to be certain, you know, these are for me, these are little children. This is someone's family member, as it would be for an adult. Um, I would never take any sort of a risk on on anything, I guess, if I if I scanned something in an abdomen um, and I was perturbed by it, I would always have that checked. So I guess when you're starting out, you're hoping to develop your skills, develop the skills for your department to be able to kind of, you know, take on, for example, pyloric stenosis scanning. But the first ever time you come across it and you're struggling to get a view, it's a little bit like, well, how much do I trust my intuition? How much do I need to have this checked by, by, by radiology? And from a soft tissue perspective, that really, really holds true. So if you never scanned a sort of hemangioma or lymphangioma, um, it's always worth bearing that in mind. I, I, look, I saw a, an ovarian cyst the other day that I had a sort of double bladder sign, the kind of worrying appearance down in the pelvis. Initially thought what I was seeing was just the bladder. And it again turned out to be a 17 centimetre ovarian cyst possibly possibly torted and you know when you've got those sorts of appearances on screen 17 centimeters it's taking up your entire view on the curvy probe you you know you're a little bit perturbed by them um i, I can touch on foreign bodies after the other guys have had 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 any response to what i'd said there but I, i've got quite an interesting foreign body story just from last week involving poker so i can come back in yeah, I, I want to hear from Beryl. Yeah, I do want to say I think it's a great point about uh, lymph nodes, um, you know, clinically integrating them. If you someone has, you know, obvious acute affection and the lymph node is um, elliptoid or, as you said, has that ratio like a bean, uh, you know, the long axis uh, is preserved. That's really good. But, uh, you know, in adults, I think the challenge is there's, there's a lot of the high, there's a higher pretest probability of you know, malignancy. So it's something to be aware of as you're scanning um, that that those cir that circular um, uh, lymph lymph node could be you know malignant. So thank you for that point. Um, Ria and Beryl, any um, reflections on um, sort of the collection of articles around soft tissue? Any? Um... I can go ahead and, and go. Um, I do want to hear the story about foreign body because I think I tried <laughs> that one time and. Uh... I, I, sw I could have sworn I saw something and this child had um, a woodworker as a father and had been playing in the shop before she came in with the cellulitis and I would have sworn that I saw a piece of wood splinter in there and sent her down to radiology and they did not see it. I, I often wonder if it's just a matter of it's a tiny little splinter or or at least in one in one axis it's a very very tiny axis to try to cut so I just wonder you know if that that was a technique difference. Um, it is hard, I think, to do foreign body soft tissue ultrasound. Um, so I'm, I'm very curious to hear this, this story. Um, the other point that I wanted to make was, I think it's a really good thing to start when you're starting out to be very um, comfortable with calling for help and saying, I saw something that I didn't, I, I've never seen before. Um, the corollary to that is, is keep on scanning because it focuses all about pattern recognition and it's all about understanding what normal soft tissue looks like, what normal lymph nodes look like, and when things strike your eye as being just not what you would normally see, that's when the alarm bell should go off and you should feel comfortable in talking to radiology. So I like that um, Dr. McCrary brought up, brought up that point about being comfortable and sort of second guessing yourself, I think, in the beginning until you get your your focus eyes as to what is what are normal patterns and does this look like a normal pattern to me. Yeah, I can't echo that enough. I think that's one of the biggest things is really just being 
able to um, know your scope, you know, and where to stop. And with foreign body, as uh, Dr. Dantel has highlighted there, it's not the easiest and always remembering that it's not real unless you're seeing something in multiple planes. <laughs> so um, turning that probe around and really trying to get around it. And I think sometimes truly what happens is that it's actually the reaction to the, the body's reaction to the foreign body that often you can see the changes that can highlight the foreign body, but get identifying what you expect to see with glass versus wood, organic, non-organic, objects as part of um, the art of figuring out um, foreign bodies and ultrasound. And um, for as far as soft tissue, some of the other things within pediatrics, you know, I, I think, again, and one of the ways we really anchor when we teach is that this is an extension of our physical exam. So you're thinking very much through what are my, what's my differential? What am I thinking as, before you're picking up that probe? Because um, we're not really going on a hunt, just um, we don't know and we're just going to look. That's really what that formal radiological exam is for. This is more of a targeted look. At and um, we have seen a handful of kids with uh, newborns with mastitis. So that's been sort of an interesting um, uh, find that we have um, looked at. And then definitely in the children where we're trying to figure out um, with the limp. I think the limping child, is it the hip? Is it osteo? Those are some of the interesting cases that we've found um, ultrasound to be useful within. Uh, but again, really being a directed sort of exam, not just, a, I'm not sure, and so I'm picking up the probe, um, at least how we teach it. Truly, you don't want to find yourself in a situation where you're just going on a hunt. Um, the way we always sort of anchor it is that you're answering a yes or no question in this patient with lymph and fever. Is there an osteomyelitis? Is there a hip effusion? Um, framing it in that sort of a, a way will keep you from going into areas that aren't within um, necessarily the scope of bedside ultrasound. That's so helpful, Beryl. Thank you so much. That's um, really excellent points um, all around. I do want to uh, give a shout out to uh, one article from uh, the April issue, uh, which is actually um, it's from a, a group at my med school, but uh, in the EM, you know, they, they talk about sonographic crepitus, and uh, this is this is the sonographic crepitus. It's a it's a point of care ultrasound finding. Um, just to be on the lookout, I think you you do have to even if you go in with a binary question like uh, is there uh, a joint effusion, is this is there an abscess, uh, you do want to be on the lookout for rare things, and I think um, David's case really highlights what rare things you know can can be presented. Um, this In this case, they talk about uh, dirty shadowing and the videos really um, describe it well. There, there are other, you know, sort of cases online of what a dirty shadowing looks like, but that that um, dirty shadowing is suggestive of necrotizing fasciitis. And I think anyone putting a probe on someone with a soft tissue infection um, should be on the lookout for what a foreign body might look like. Should, you know, in, in one view is no view, as you said, you know, looking in two planes. But also, uh, they really should be aware of what um, neck fascia is. And, and that, that's not an um, easy diagnosis to make on, you know, uh, physical exam, I guess, in, in extremis, of course, um, when it's, you know, crepitus uh, all up the all up a limb, it, it can be, um, you know, it's an emergency. But I think with, with the, the sonographic findings, um, unless you're taught to, to know what visualizing, you know, that hyperechoic sub-Q air looks like, um, you know, you might miss that. And so that's another thing just to learn about um, the, the zebras that, that you could find, you know, when you're putting the probe on, even if you were looking for fluid, oops, I saw um, dirty shadowing. This is actually not an abscess. The reason it's not better is because it's, um, you know, neck fash. So um, I think that's an important point and take a look, listeners, at, at the, the April issue at that. Um, so um, just to close out, I do want to um, give everyone a chance to uh, respond, but also David, if you if you want to tell us your story about uh, the soft tissue um, foreign body from last week, um, that'd be great. Well, what a learning point. So it culminated with the, the child's mother, 15 year old boy, I'll, I'll explain in a sec, culminated with her p kindly and politely coming up to see me afterwards and asking for my name. And she was a midwife, and not in our hospital, but in a local hospital. And I was like, oh, no, you're going to complain, aren't you? I'm going to lose my job. And she was laughing. She was like, no, I want to drop you in a little present. And when I tell you the the sort of absolute hash I made of everything over the preceding hour, you'll be you'll be as amazed as me that she was going to do that rather than complain to me. So I had a big 15-year-old boy who was hanging a Christmas decoration. He put his hand through a, a window. Now he came in with a gigantic piece of glass in it in his palmer aspect, almost at the sort of carpus level, sort of you know between wrist and hand. Um, this chunk of glass was like horror movie style, sort of nine centimeters embedded. So we got him into the treatment room, um, oral analgesia. He was pretty chilled, big guy, thankfully. 
so pressure drip bandages ready, everything ready. Put remove this piece of glass and a little bit of a spurt. So pressure for a good 10 minutes chatting to him. So I had a plan to kind of explore for further foreign body within that region. Now I could see to the base of the wound very well. So I could see that there was this triangular flap. I uh, explored it under, under local with irrigation. Um, really good clean, no tendon sheaths exposed or anything like that. So I felt fairly happy we could manage it in the ED ourselves. And he was he was certainly very happy, as was mum. So if you imagine the wound being, as I say, at the base of the sort of inner wrist, you know, almost where you'd palpate for the for the radial artery, but but in the midline. We I managed to put six sutures in around the flap, got pretty good coverage. And then I'd, I'd already investigated under direct vision for further bits of glass and, and scanned within that region was really really happy so we were talking about what a foreign body would look like now his thena remnants on the affected hand did look a bit puffier than his other side so i was like okay this is we'll put a bit of local in we've had probably 10 mils he's a big guy and i was like yeah i think this is all just edema so we're scanning so i scanned all around the thena remnants sure enough bit of bit of free sort of slightly free fluid almost you know either a bit of edema but probably just my local and then I scanned up and up and up and up and just literally kept the probe on, you know, probably just to talk to him really and to kind of demonstrate to the interested mother what I was scanning for. So I got up to the level of his inner sort of MCPJ, so the palmar aspect of his of his knuckle on his middle finger. So that you're talking on his big hands, that's at least, you know, whole palms away, kind of 10, 15 centimetres. The flap extended no further than the the kind of inner creases you get at the the carpus of the wrist all the skin completely intact on his palm no wound no tracking nothing just a completely normal sight and what did i find a massive sort of hyperechoic you know inorganic looking piece of material foreign body so i'd spent all this time on this little wound of the the flap obviously i couldn't have done anything about this foreign body because it was well away from the flap but basically I then poor lad I, I give him a bit more local last was he happy for me to have a little look and try to retrieve this um we'd wrote a you know we'd wrote the guideline on on foreign body retrieval in the PTD and again it works really really well um I think there's a paper that suggests that up to 40 percent of foreign bodies are missed first time on radiographic assessment um and again as, as the the panel have touched upon tonight you're looking for secondary signs you're looking for a surrounding you know hypochoic regions with edema and um, so it's lent itself really really well to children who are willing to comply and we've had some real success with it but in this case oh it was just i felt absolutely terrible because i really would have missed that if i hadn't have just ran the probe maybe you know casually a few centimeters higher she was sort of asking me what we're looking for what what we're looking for and i was pointing everything out that's tiny little bits of of fluid pockets and that's this and this you know nothing to worry about that's a bony contour and then almost put the probe away and just as i did i got a glimmer of this shred of of glass so wow learning point for next time just to interrogate both hands fingers thumbs everywhere and then we can send them home without an x-ray because that's what we'd normally do for foreign body we wouldn't involve normal x-rays so yeah a bit of an embarrassing one for me guys well, that's really just a terrific um, example of how a point of care ultra set up in the end. And I think in contrast to the um, case that we talked about in, uh, from our um, issue about the delayed uh, foreign body, I think, um, you know, it's it's definitely a good reminder that those things can be missed and retained. So um, I, I really um, uh, appreciate all of your, your time here today. Um, Beryl and Ria, if you had any uh, closing thoughts, um, otherwise we can... Uh -huh. I Go just ahead. wanted to say congratulations. Um, I think that patient was actually quite lucky to have you, <laughs> Dr. McCreary, and I want to congratulate you on your your publication of that of your of your case. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. Strong work. Keep going on the other side. <laughs> yeah, I was, I was going to say that the next uh, we, April is our next issue. If you want to uh, submit the uh, this case you just des described, um, you know the editorial board um, is here today, so they'll they'll review the case um, when you send when you send it in. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. The foreign the foreign body pictures on Pocus were were spectacular. The what I missed was this huge dagger like piece of glass coming out of this guy's hand. I should have thought on my feet and said, <laughs> Yeah, I'll get you sorted. I'll get you sorted. However, I've got this fantastic journal who would uh, <laughs> <laughs> doesn't go down well with parents if you do it in that order, no. <laughs> 
Wow. Well, uh, with that, I'll uh, thank uh, you, you, David, so much for your time. And uh, of course, our pediatric um, editorial board members, um, Dr. Dansell and Dr. Graywood, thank you so much for uh, what a robust discussion of, um, you know, pediatric uh, soft tissue pocus. And um, it's just so great to uh, hear about uh, the enthusiasm um, you have, David, and uh, share our stories together. And uh, we hope our listeners uh, were able to uh, get something out of this and, and take a look at the focusjournal.com for uh, further learning. Thank you all.